down by men. They weren't necessarily originally told by men, but whoever decided to put them to paper and then the however many tens or even hundreds of people that had to copy and recopy that paper so that we have it now were men. And that really affects how the stories uh, are told and how they get passed down to us in pretty dark, but also really interesting ways uh, because we can kind of think about, you know, what um, could have could have been back then if um, anyone else was was telling these stories. Um, I'm going to, sorry, stop real quick. Do, uh, Kirsten, do you know if there's any way to like turn off the notification for people joining on my end? Sorry, everyone, but there's like a beeping in my noise every time anyone joins. It probably can't, but yeah. it's fine. I was, okay. I was thinking about that. <laughs> I think people, like, I'm just gonna... since it's, hopefully, hopefully it should get a little bit better now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not to worry. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, it's totally fine. I'm just like, if I can stop that. Um, yeah, so essentially, like, I'm just most interested in kind of in all of those things. Uh, and I think Homeric epic and women in those stories are the perfect example. Um, I also just uh, noticed I'm going to point out it's very likely that a cat is going to jump up on my lap at any point because this is all just work from home situations here. Um, so women in Homeric epic, I think the the number one person that we think of is going to be Helen, um, you know, notably named Helen cool. of Troy. I'm not sure what everyone has and has not studied. I know you guys are working off of um, Emily Wilson's Odyssey. So that, uh, that certainly is like an incredible translation, which I will mention later. Um, but in terms of the Iliad, you know, Helen is our number one um, and the Odyssey as well, actually, I'll get to that. <laughs> this is just how my, my mind pops around to lots of different scenarios. But Helen, I find so interesting because everything we know about her from a pop culture perspective, from just like generally living in the Western world and taking in information, suggests like so many different things about her. You know, she left with Paris completely of her own free will. She left husband and child behind in Sparta and she went off to Troy to start a new life. Or she was kidnapped by Paris and she didn't want to go at all. And she left for Troy for that reason. There's so many different opportunities or so many different like thoughts that we have on her as this character. And, you know, the whole of the war is basically blamed on her from the Iliad and beyond when in all the actual sources and everything, Helen doesn't actually really have a say in anything. We don't know what choice she made or didn't make. We don't know what she felt about anything. She just kind of exists in this like really brief realm of, she has like a handful of lines in the Iliad and yet the whole thing is going on because of her in this really fascinating way where she is constantly being blamed by, by the people who are waging this war over her when in truth, you know, we have all these ideas about, about why the war is waged or what have you, or just it's because of Helen. But obviously if we really think about it critically, it is just because men are angry that something was taken away from them. Um, so she gets this blame in such a fascinating way because really ultimately Menelaus is mad because his property was taken away from him by Paris, whether or not she went willingly. Um, and I find that just the, the nature of how we think of Helen in the modern world or and in the ancient sources is just so affected by the way that men behaved and the way that they held on to their property, which in this case is a literal woman, um, and, and how that kind of affects how we see her as a character. She gets so few lines. She just speaks, you know, in Troy. She kind of looks out over the people, gives them information, and we just know nothing about how she actually feels about the situation. Um, and then moving on to the Odyssey, she's I find an even more fascinating character because in the Odyssey, we see her in this completely different situation where she has been returned to Sparta with her husband, Menelaus, um, where we see this because Telemachus goes to speak to Menelaus searching for his father. And, and in that case, Helen is not only like a, a well-spoken and fairly strong character compared to 
to her role in the Iliad, uh, but she actually performs magic in this really fascinating way that it, of course, there are so many debates about whether or not, you know, there was one person called Homer. It's very unlikely that there was, um, but who wrote down the Iliad and the Odyssey and whether or not they ever had the same author or whether, you know, it, they're just completely two separate epic poems that were developed over time by so many different people. It's fascinating to think about. I think the example of Helen is the perfect example for the, the latter argument that who knows, you know, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, but it was unlikely to be the same person. They have such different stories and vibes and just like the entire way the stories are told are, are so completely different between the two works. Uh, but the Helen in the Odyssey it is basically a witch in certain ways. She um, she like creates this thing to make everybody happy and make everybody calm down and have a nice time and like basically drugs everyone in there, which is just it's such a different um, situation for her. And I, and I just often think about, you know, where um, where these different versions were coming from, who, you know, maybe had a more interesting take on Helen and inserted that into the work. There's also, um, you know, there's arguments to be made uh, and that scholars do make about whether or not the first, I think it's the first four books of the Odyssey were actually included in the original, in whatever way the original story appeared, um, just because they, they don't really fit with the rest of the story either. And Helen is in those initial bits. You have to wonder whether she was always in the story. Did she, in the ancient world, the way people listened to epics, the way they took the epics in, you know, you're sitting around a fire in a palace, you're hearing this story being sung to you, like, that's how they would have been taken in for two, three, four hundred years, maybe until somebody wrote them down. Um, and so, you know, the, the people listening to them in that way, did they always hear that Helen went back to Menelaus? Did they hear that they had a happy marriage after 10 years of war over this woman? It's just a fascinating thing to think about the way that these things uh, could have been changing or just different depending upon who is telling the story. Um, I talk a lot about about just epic poetry in general on my show and how these things can change because ultimately these are just traveling poets moving around. And so because of that, you can even imagine the ways where, you know, a, a, a poet in a certain town, if they're further in the East, they're likely to really amplify the stories of the Trojans because those are the people that are closest to them. If they're on the Greek mainland or in the Peloponnese, they're going to emphasize the story of Troy or sorry, of, of Sparta and Mycenae because those are the people closest to them. They're going to make Agamemnon and Menelaus out to be these incredible people. They're going to, you know, point to a queen in on her throne in, when they're singing to her and they're going to say well Helen was beautiful much like you queen or something like that there's so many fascinating ways to think about what you know could and could not be going on in these retellings or it rather in these epic poems as they were originally um, sung around <laughs> someone's got their microphone on <laughs> um, so Helen is just such a fascinating character for that reason uh, and, but I think she so perfectly into her sister, uh, Clytemnestra, who is seen in, in almost sort of an opposite way, um, in an equally entertaining and fascinating way. I really prefer Clytemnestra. I could talk about her for hours. But of course, Clytemnestra and Helen are sisters. Helen is the acknowledged more beautiful one, you know, the more impressive one, the one people wanted first. And Clytemnestra was sort of like second best. She got the brother and all these different things. Um, and I, I find that very interesting because the entire war is waged over Helen as a person when, in, you know, it's certainly not her fault, but the entire war is waged over her and her beauty and the right to have her, to possess her. Um, meanwhile, her sister uh, becomes villainized in this completely different way where Helen, the war is fought all over her. They finally win everyone is dead except for like a handful of Greeks and a few women including Helen and then Helen just goes back to her life on Sparta like nothing happened like it's just the most bizarre thing to think about like she just heads back oh there's your daughter your husband who's been fighting this war over your name for 10 years and you just have to go back to that life 
and nobody ever really talks about how that would be weird it's never featured into a story about what her life might have been like after that meanwhile the entire stories about any of these characters after the war beyond Odysseus and all his mess trying to get home is Clytemnestra and what she does to her husband when she gets home which if anyone I'm, I'm sure I don't know what kind of <laughs> studying you guys have already done on this but she kills Agamemnon when he gets home um, stabs him in the bath uh, she has a little bit of help from somebody else and in some of the plays he does the stabbing but I really prefer to picture it as Clytemnestra because she's just so righteously angry at her husband because he sacrificed their daughter on the way to Troy just for some good wind but Clytemnestra is I mean granted granted it's a murder murder is never good but she has all these like righteous reasonings for what she does and yet she is like completely vilified in the ancient texts like the plays are a little bit different you never quite know you know what uh a, one of the tragedians is is making up on his own versus uh what you know was actually accepted back then or what appeared in like the the oral storytelling but in the odyssey we get this really interesting look at the comparison between women um particularly Clytemnestra and then Odysseus's wife Penelope who we're to believe is is waiting so patiently at home for him this entire time she's the model wife versus Clytemnestra who in the Odyssey Odysseus travels to the underworld he speaks with all the dead heroes that he fought with at Troy basically anyone who died at any point before Odysseus got there he's going to speak to them and we get this really fascinating look into Clytemnestra, how she's seen in the epics, but particularly through the eyes of Agamemnon. But you kind of have to wonder whether, you know, this is just how she was seen in that archaic period versus later. Um, and it, it is just truly this comparison of Agamemnon says to Odysseus, like, oh, your wife is back home. She's so good and she's waiting for you and she's a perfect wife. She hasn't done anything while you've been away and she's just been this incredibly, you know, wonderful and steadfast woman this whole time. Meanwhile, my wife, I went home and she killed me. And it's just such an interesting thing. It's definitely not meant to be funny, but Agamemnon's absolutely awful. And so I think it's hilarious. Uh, but it's such an interesting way to look at the way that these, men saw their wives you know if you have this incredibly virtuous and beautiful wife who's waiting at home for you like she's just perfect and and there's no complaints at all you have this comparison versus oh my wife is strong-willed and angry that I killed our daughter like oh god she's so awful you know to to be mad at me for for murdering my child um you, you have the more reasoned wife and and mine is the worst it's just, um, I feel like I'm not making any uh, concrete arguments here. I can just talk about these women forever. But it, it's just, they're all just so interesting. And then we get to Penelope, who, you know, is meant to be seen as this perfect woman, not because she is like Helen style. She's not so beautiful that everyone in the world wants to steal her away and, and keep her as their own. She's just she's just like basically holding down the fort for Odysseus for 20 years. And, and that alone makes her into be this like, this like paragon of virtue. I mean, well, all it really is, is her just being annoyed that all of these men are like raging through her home this entire time. And, and she does miss her husband. She makes that very clear, but it's not like, you know, it, it just, it, I'm gonna lose my train of thought it's just such an interesting thing to to consider how how these women were seen and and why you know Penelope is good just because she just like stays you know quote-unquote pure for Odysseus while he's away she doesn't give in to the suitors you know that's how it's seen obviously in truth we understand the way consent works it's not about her giving in to the suitors they're there and she doesn't want them there if something had happened it certainly would not have been on her or anything to suggest she's anywhere less virtuous than they think but just because she had the luck of nothing happening to her and she just didn't want them around she gets to be seen as this 
utterly perfect woman and held up on this pedestal. Even today, she's you, you can see her name referenced in a lot of instances like that, where we have this idea of an ideal woman, and it's it's always going to be Penelope. She is just this this perfect person for no other reason than you know she just did exactly what Odysseus wanted from her while she was gone. And so you do have to wonder what these stories would have been like in you know a less patriarchal oh, world God. certainly but also just in you know if if the if women were telling these stories and and that's when I'm going to turn over to a, a question that was submitted um, because I also need something uh, to work off of <laughs> so I can stop just rambling thoughts um, but the question that was submitted was, are there any accounts of Greek, ancient Greek life as written by a woman, and are they different from a man's perspective? Uh, and the answer is yes, uh, but we don't know much of them. And that alone I find interesting, which is why I wanted to talk about it. So every, all of the writing that we have and, and really think of um, when it comes to the ancient Greeks, like the, the most famous and important pieces that we have today were all written down by men. Again, these are all oral storytelling. I think that's the most interesting thing to remember. And I think it's something that as modern people, we have a lot of trouble wrapping our heads around and reminding ourselves how these things worked. So one thing I'm asked a lot uh, on my podcast is things like, you know, well, I heard this version, but you've told this version, or, you know, is this version right or wrong um, in the mythology? Because we have so many like really varying, like really broadly different versions of, of stories and characters, or, you know, timelines that don't match up. We were like, so Heracles, you know, sacked Troy, like, couple generations before the Trojan War, but also he was like friends with certain people who are in the war. All these different questions where chronology doesn't match up or or, or variations exist that just make one, have, you know, add one detail that means the rest of the details don't make any sense. Um, and a lot of people have trouble wrapping their heads around it or they want to know what is the right version, what's the original version. And I think the thing to just constantly remind yourself when you're trying to wrap your head around how these stories functioned in the ancient world is that they were not writing them in the way that we write stories or think of stories now. There was no one there to say like, oh, well, no, this couldn't happen at this time because this, this, and this have to happen first, or because this person's already dead, or because this person's not born yet. There's no continuity. There's no one keeping track of that stuff because these weren't narratives in the way that we understand them now. They weren't writing them down to be bound in a book and to be read, you know, 2,700 years later, but even just to be bound in a book and read. I spoke to an incredible scholar once who said, who told me that, um, you know, the, the person who finally did, or the people, a group probably, who finally did put the Homeric epic pieces that we know of now as the Iliad and the Odyssey, the person, the people who finally put them to paper, they probably created this book, they wrote them down so that they had a record, and then it probably just sat somewhere forever because no one wanted to read Homer. You wanted to hear the stories being sung to you because that's how they were meant to be told. So books weren't written to be read later, to be understood in the way they are now. And that's why things changed. Things were written or things were sung and told over many hundreds of years. Um, and I know I started talking about the woman, <laughs> the one woman writer that we had, but it's just, that's the most important way I think of understanding how, but which leads to, there is one woman writer of who, of whose work we actually have record of now. We know there were other women writing or rather singing, writing their own songs, because all of these were not, they weren't books, they weren't poems, they were songs. The Iliad and the Odyssey included. They were meant to be sung while somebody, while the, the singer played an instrument, probably a lyre, along to the songs. So they were songwriters. They were basically like indie songwriters of today. I'm not going to think of a reference that's 
<laughs> relevant. Um, but they were indie songwriters of today. They were people who were writing these things to be sung around a fire or traveled around and shared these stories all over. And the one woman whose work survives is a woman named Sappho. She's from the island of Lesbos. It's just in modern pronunciation, it's Lesbos. Uh, and she was an incredibly famous poet and, and songwriter, essentially. But because of the way she, she was incredibly well respected in her time, but at the same time, within a few hundred years, there was enough, I think just enough misogyny, whatever you want to say it, enough patriarchy that had just like gotten even worse, if you could believe it, or, you know, in the following years basically her work was written down at some point but whoever was then making the calls you know 100 200 300 years later to recopy those manuscripts before they crumbled into dust did not consider Sappho to be important enough to be recopied this probably happened closer to the Christian era when it was like oh my god there's a woman She's writing about love. It's a it, just a woman in general writing about love and sex for that matter. She also writes a lot of erotic poetry. And they were like, no, 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 like this cannot be copied down. And so as far as I understand it, we don't have any of Sappho's writing that was intentionally preserved in the way that say Homer is. Instead, what we have of her writing is fragments. And the reason we have fragments of her writing is because she wrote on papyrus and typically these survived only because the papyrus was reused later for something else. And then it was found by archaeologists either on mummifications of even just, you know, off in Egypt, they would mummify animals. And a lot of the time papyrus scraps, it's just like using a scrap piece of paper you know, for something else later, or like paper mache later, like, I'll just find all my old class notes, and I'll paper mache something for an art class. And then 2000 years later, some archaeologist finds it, and then they've got your class notes. And like, that is how we have Sappho's writing, which I just find to be the most incredible thing. And we know that she was famous, like a few hundred years after her time. So she was writing in about the 600s BCE. And Plato famously called her the 10th muse. So Plato's like 300 years after that. And he considered her to be so important. So we know she was like incredibly famous. We know that she was long lasting. Her work survived for at least a few hundred years. But then somewhere down the line, people stopped copying it down and then it didn't get preserved to us today. So it, there's, there's either one or two full poems of hers, excuse me, that we have. And that the rest is like, one, two, three lines of poetry that have just survived on those little papyrus fragments. And it's fascinating. But what we do know about her writing is that one, you know, she was like this super famous poet and songwriter, but also she wrote love poetry either for herself or others. Um, the reason those questions are, are out there is because she wrote about love poetry for women and men. Um, she wrote erotic poetry devoted to, you know, professing love to women and to men. And so we have these, these kind of fascinating questions that surround her. Um, of course, she is like very famously, you know, basically the origin for the word lesbian because she was from Lesbos and she did write love songs to women. Um, and then, so you have all these different, there's, there's arguments basically that Sappho was a lesbian, that Sappho was um, bisexual, that Sappho was straight, uh, Ovid famously wrote uh, a story of her much later in the Roman period where she uh, is actually so in love with the man that she ends up taking her own life, which is, I mean, the question of Sappho's sexuality is not one that I'm going to get into because there's no, like, you can't really put modern understandings of, of sexuality onto ancient people. Um, and I think that these people should be whoever anyone wants or needs them to be for their own, you know, life um but it, it the Ovid thing is, is dark you shouldn't read it um but Sappho is is a beautiful connection we have to the real world through a women's voice not only because she wrote these these love poems to lots of different um, people and genders but because she she wasn't writing these poems to be stories they were they were poems more and songs in more in the way that we would see them now 
so they're not like the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're just kind of, they're like love notes, they're love songs. You know, she's the Taylor Swift of, of ancient Greece, I think is, no, I am not the first person to say that, but it's a very apt description of her where, you know, they're beautiful and they're telling and they have some stories kind of woven through them, but they're not narratives. They're just like these ancient songs, but you get a sense of, of how they viewed Aphrodite as the progenitor of love. Like if you were in love, it was the work of Aphrodite. There was no in between or Eros, you know, that more erotic side of, of love from Greek mythology. And so she would just like weave these, these, gods and goddesses into her story to her songs in a way that you really get the sense of like how the gods and goddesses you know were a huge part of everyday life and just like existing in the ancient world in this really beautiful way but mostly I mean Sappho is just like the greatest example of there is there was a woman writing back then she was famous enough you know her stuff might have been mostly lost since then but she was incredibly famous back then um, one thing I'll say is she's often called the first uh, woman poet of, of the world or the Western world, what have you. Um, but actually there is this Mesopotamian poet who's like, I don't know, at least a thousand years, I think, before Sappho. Her name is Edhedwana. And she, yes, from Mesopotamia and is officially the first rec poet on record, period. And she's a woman. Um, and is often forgotten. So I think it's important to note her, though I don't actually know that much about her or her poetry, but she existed and that is incredibly cool. Um, uh, I've got another question here that I will uh, touch upon because I've just been rambling so much about my own nonsense thoughts now, uh, but how would mythologies change if women were portrayed uh, as, uh, Oh, did I not cover this corrected? Oh, yes, more as more than just objects. I'm trying to read from my screen. Um, yeah, I mean, I think everything would be different. I like my whole point of, of my podcast is to look at um, myths and stories just in a, with a critical eye. Like, I don't change the stories, but I just kind of look at them as if, you know, there wasn't a man who had made all of the decisions and who had made all of the calls on what to write down and why and like who was and was not important because I think the reason that there's not a lot of women um like stories featuring women as like a focal point in the myth or in the myth that we have rather is is not because people weren't telling the stories back then not because women weren't telling each other stories or there weren't poets singing more about women as like actual main characters in our own stories but just because the people who wrote them down later didn't want those stories weren't interested in them like the works that we have now are are purely because enough people had to decide they were important and and just broadly like women's stories weren't considered important so what we often have when we look at women as people in the ancient world is like archaeological evidence like be it art or pottery or like tablets where they would just kind of almost tell their own stories um, I had a, a, another guest on my show who spoke about uh, these these tablets that are found in this certain area of Greece that are dedicated to Persephone. And they're done by women who were going off to get married themselves. And they would create this thing as sort of like a thank you to Persephone in honor of their wedding. And and we get these really interesting differences between how women might have seen their impending marriage. Um, some are really excited and they, they depict Persephone and Hades um, in this like very happy and loving kind of way, like a woman going off on a chariot with a man, like clearly, you know, excited for it. And then meanwhile, there are others where they will show almost the same scene of a woman going off with a man on a chariot, but she's clearly fearful or worried or just generally not pumped about it at all. And it's really interesting to see the way these women would actually kind of tell their own stories, but connect them to the gods and goddesses in this really interesting way. Like, you know, there's a lot to be said about the actual, the myth we have about, of, of Persephone's, of Persephone's, of Persephone and Hades. Um, but regardless of like the, the myth that survives, we have these really interesting notions about how 
women experiencing an actual major life change like that would have felt about it themselves. It's just, it's very interesting. Um, okay, more, more questions off in the chat there. How does grief construct femininity in mythology and can it re-territorialize masculinity? Well phrased to the point where my brain is just wrapping <laughs> itself around it. Um, yeah, I mean, being a woman, um, you know, in, in ancient Greece was, or it, rather in, in Greek mythology is a lot about grief and anger. I would say anger more than anything, like the women of mythology, the famous ones, the ones who have big, long stories that we can refer to now, they're usually angry. You know, they're angry, often righteously, but still the the story is their anger. That's the case for Clytemnestra. The story that we have of her is anger. It's like her spending 10 years just fuming at Agamemnon for sacrificing their daughter and just planning his murder for 10 years, just like stewing in her. It's grief as well, but it's like, it's angry grief. And their stories are so based around that, that I think it just makes, it demonizes women in this dark, but I mean, interesting to look at now kind of way. It applies to Medea, certainly, like everything we know about Medea is that she killed her children, right? That actually, that bit about her story was only added by Euripides in his play, whereas the rest of her story with Jason and, and everything she did for him, and she did some other bad things in it, but didn't kill her children. Um, but that had existed for like many hundreds of years before. And so it's really interesting that that becomes like the one thing, the thing that makes her kind of like quote unquote monster. The thing we think about now was actually added much later, possibly just for the drama of a play, the visualizing of that. Um, you know, just basically just like, it's like ad uh, adapting a movie and making it more dramatic, more over the top um, or, or violent than like an original story or something. It's really, it's interesting. Um, sorry, that was not really answering the question, but I do think, yeah, I don't totally know <laughs> how to answer that one. Um, but I do think it just says a lot about the way that we see women of Greek mythology, because a lot of the time people just tend to to look at these stories that we have and just say like, okay, well, that's just, that that is women of mythology. There's no other way of seeing them. Um, but I think it is really important to look at like why these stories exist and who wrote them down and, and why we have them. And, and it, the minute you look at any of that, it's pretty obvious that that's just not how women were seen broadly. Um, it's just a matter of like who wrote down what. A lot of what we have too about women um, in myths and in ancient Greece generally comes from Athens because most of our evidence, certainly most of our textual evidence comes from Athens. It's just a matter of like luck and archeology span and importance and, and everything. But um, women in Athens were treated particularly worse than in most other places in the Greek mainland. They were like confined to their homes. They were property like this. It, they were, it was much worse for them than anywhere else. And and I think that's really interesting because it it gives this, and I'm, I'm guilty of it in my podcast as well, but it gives this like false sense of women were like literally nothing back then, or they were always property. They're always seen as like, you know, almost inhuman. And it really like is, is mostly true of Athens and not necessarily elsewhere. Um, again, now I'm just uh, going off into other thoughts. So it's another question. How important are reinterpretations of stories told by men, like the Penelope in, in changing modern retelling of these stories? I think they're really important. Um, the Penelope Ed is an interesting example. I haven't read it in well over 10 years, um, but it is such an interesting example because, it, because I mean, I think Penelope deserves that, but also because the way Margaret Atwood did it is to write it in the same kind of style. I don't know if she did it in the like um, di didactic hexameter, is that what it is? Dactylic hexameter, um, the like meter of the time. Uh, but, you know, the fact that she just wrote it in verse generally and like put it all into place in a way that is so similar to the Odyssey is really, really interesting. So I think that definitely adds a lot. Um, but I also think like, I don't know, modern retellings, I think, are generally important for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think they're important for us today purely just for representation. 
Uh, I think it's the same with queer retellings and, and retellings of anything like that. I think it's important for people to uh, just be able to see themselves in books about these, these ancient places, but also just sort of to take back the way that these stories and these people have been kind of like really held on tight by old white men. Um, and that's like true of academia in the last hundred, like before the last hundred years and everything too. So, I mean, the more retellings by women, I think, or, or you know, marginalized genders, people of color, what have you, like the more the better because it's just a matter of getting representation into these stories and, and seeing other people. I mean, it, it certainly applies to, to people of color and everything too because there's like a level of whiteness that's ascribed to these ancient worlds. Um, that is like deeply inaccurate and they were, uh, so I think that's really important as well. I think it's mostly important or even more important in movies and stuff, but we've just not seen that really done um, in a way that like is, has made a meaningful impact and I think it should. Um, okay, another question. Are there more stories in Greek and Roman history where men and women have viewed them differently, i.e. Medusa? What a great reason to talk about Medusa. Um, <laughs> Medusa is a great, like, topic broadly because it like less so about women and men definitely about women and men kind of today but in terms of like the long like stretch of her history it not hasn't necessarily been that it's more just been like everything else that kind of has affected her story um but you think of Medusa today and you think of this like a monster who terrorized areas maybe that one's that questionable about how many people actually see that from the pop culture but Certainly you think of a monster who's going to turn everybody to stone, who's like surrounded by all of these people she transformed and, you know, who Perseus like was right to kill because she was dangerous, what have you. But in the ancient sources, like the the oldest source that we have for Medusa, there's it's like three lines. It's like she was a Gorgon. Uh, she was the only Gorgon who was mortal. She was with Poseidon, oof, and she suffered a woeful fate. And then later on, it describes that, like, Perseus cut off her head and, and Pegasus was born, um, and Chrysior, he's always forgotten. But that is, that's it for the story of Medusa. And the oldest source, there's nothing about her being dangerous. There's nothing about her harming anyone. In fact, the up until Ovid, as far as I've been able to tell, which is a lot of research on Medusa, there isn't a single case in the ancient times or like before Ovid, meaning all of basically ancient Greece, there isn't a single example of Medusa harming any person while her head is on her body. It, everyone that's harmed is after her head's been removed and used by Perseus. So it's really interesting because basically, according to every ancient Greek source, certainly. She's just this woman. She's divine, but she's mortal. She has snakes for hair. She's monstrous in some kind of way, but but not in a way that inherently makes her bad. It just makes her like not human looking. Um, and she lives at the very edge of the world. She lives as far as you can go in the mythological understanding of the world. And she lives there just minding her own business. Um, and Perseus kills her, but he kills her specifically because, you know, the king of Seraphos wants him dead and he thinks that it's going to kill him. Not because he's helping anyone or like saving anyone from getting hurt by Medusa, purely because it was like, this is probably going to kill Perseus if he tries. And that's the intention. And I think that alone is really fascinating because she, there's just nothing to suggest that she needed to be killed at all or that it like affected anything she's like literally not a problem and then she's become this thing and and now I think women and and other people certainly are trying to take her back because there's, no, <laughs> there's just like she is this great fascinating character she's a survivor of of like you know being assault by a god um and she is just like just lives her life off in the middle of nowhere before she's killed for no reason. I don't know. I, I usually frame my sentences or <laughs> thoughts on Medusa better, but my brain's going everywhere right now. Um, but she's just generally fascinating um, to, to consider as a way that the, the world today has like taken 
what was basically just a strong and independent woman from Greek mythology and turned her into this absolute monster who needs to be killed. Um, it, it's it's truly wild the way she's been totally misinterpreted as this like creature, this deadly being. It's it's fascinating. Um, I've talked about it a lot on my podcast if you want to hear me sound smarter about it. So on to the next question. Uh, are there any stories about Spartan women? I've heard some pretty badass things about them, but I was wondering about the actual ancient stories that we have. Um, so Spartan women, Sparta in general, like I just don't think they that we have a lot of their writing. Um, that said, like, I mean, I research sources obsessively and I've never come across um, anything really about Sparta. I know there is stuff. So actually I'm currently like in the planning stages of a really big long series about Sparta in basically whatever way I can cover it because not only is it a really interesting place and I think women had a lot more um, autonomy but that said the Spartans generally have been misunderstood in like both correct and incorrect kind of ways like the Sparta of, of 300 is not a thing <laughs> like the the almost every notion kind of in it I think is like really skewed towards making them seem like this incredible people and they were but like not not in that way I don't know it's a very problematic movie um but just women in general I do think they had a lot more autonomy mostly women outside of Athens had a lot more autonomy uh and it's it's interesting I don't know I basically I don't know enough about Sparta but I'm working on it because I think it's it's going to be a, or it is a very interesting place, but because everything that we, or most, you know, mainstream sources, if you're not like deep, deep in academia, um, handle Athens or get their information from Athens because of that, um, Sparta sort of has fallen by the wayside because they were obviously like fighting each other for a very long time. Uh, and so I think I think a lot of it has to do with that and just generally being a people who weren't as interested in um, in writing their their stories down or or like just keeping records like that. It's just a matter, too, of like. You're really interested in writing things down, and if they weren't, then we have a lot less to work off of and we have to lot, decide a lot more things or determine a lot more things based on archaeological evidence, which is like certainly possible and you can get a lot from that. And I'm not an archaeologist, so I won't try to pretend like I really know. But ultimately, like the reason we have so much more information about other places is because we literally have the writing of it and we don't really have a lot of that for Sparta. So that's kind of interesting in itself. Um, all right, what do you think the difference in portrayal of male and female gods in Homer says about gender attitudes? Uh, I don't know if I should read it all out loud, but I'm going to end societal roles of the time as Zeus and Hera. How does this affect daily life and storytelling? It's so I often wonder about how the gods in Homer really affect um, like the general understanding of the gods broadly, because it is a very I mean, it's a very archaic source, obviously, but it also has a lot of contradictory things which is quite interesting, like compared to some of the other sources we have on mythology. Obviously the two like big names we have for archaic mythology are, are Homer and Hesiod. And they say two very different things. I mean, granted they're like regional differences are huge when it comes to trying to understand the mythologies or like who believed what it's often like, this was not a unified country, not even at that time, like really unified city states that was coming. like. It's just these regional things and they were really only connected vaguely by their language but even that really varied across the regions and everything so it's just interesting to think about and i think we often get stuck in thinking of like greece but that did not exist um even the word greece is latin uh but generally the you know i think the gods tend not to represent um how they understood gender roles because I think they just got a pass kind of on everything. Like to an extent, obviously Hera is pretty beholden to Zeus, um, a little bit less so in the Iliad, which I find interesting. Um, the role of Thetis in the Iliad is really interesting because she holds a lot of power 
and we get this kind of like inklings at backstory about why she does and you get this idea that you know there was a time when Hera staged a coup against Zeus and they all tried to bring him down because he was being so tyrannical and, and Thetis was the one who helped him and got this favor that she then used to like help Achilles in the war and so I think the women broadly get this really it's it's difficult to get an understanding about these things from the gods because inherently they were gods um you know Athena's obviously incredibly interesting you know in the Iliad and beyond she gets to be the sort of most important woman goddess or more like most well-respected woman goddess but she does it at the like basically she does it by just being a man's goddess she's just like helps all the heroes and she helps all the men she doesn't really care for the women and thus she's like all the dudes favorite goddess which i find incredibly interesting but yeah i often i often wonder about how it does affect the societal roles of the time and like i'm not uh super well versed in the history like i've got the mythology like the stories of the mythology in my brain um but I'm less, uh, I'm getting more and more aware of, of the historical aspects and things, but I definitely don't know enough. I'm constantly trying to learn more. Um, but what are my thoughts on characters like Calypso and Circe? They are both very interesting. I think, um, I mean, the Calypso of it all is like, it, there's a lot of questions I think about how to see her. Um, I kind of see it as like Odysseus lands with her and at the time he's just kind of like hey this might be a nice place for me to rest for a little bit I've been through a lot I watched a lot of people die because I'm a very bad leader um, and like here's this nice lady you know she's kind of pretty is that a bonus and then you know she ends up keeping him there for seven years and then before long he's like I do not want to be here anymore so it's an interesting kind of balance of of like how to visualize the consent too because it's obviously not explicit at all you have to kind of just make your own judgments based on on the very minimal information that we have because also people like calypso specifically a little bit less so cersei but like it it still quite applies to her but these these characters are almost exclusive to the odyssey which is sort of fascinating in itself. Like, as far as I know, Calypso does not really appear anywhere else other than maybe as a named nymph, but that might be it. Um, and meanwhile, Circe does and does not, but like, I think um, the, the Odyssey is certainly like the earliest source for Circe, as far as I know. Um, and she alone, like, I just love Circe. She's fascinating. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll take a strong independent witch living all on her own with like a bunch of wild animals and like ladies hanging out. It sounds like an ideal life, but I, I do really appreciate Cersei in the Odyssey because she does get to be this, like I kind of see her as almost equally strong and like full of character and like, I guess with enough agency, like almost equal to Penelope, if not more so. Um, obviously she isn't seen that way because she, you know, has witchy powers and things. So she's been sort of made into an other in a different way than, than Penelope. Um, but broadly, I think she's just super fascinating because she, you know, does have all of this independence and she kind of just like, oh, Odysseus, you're here. Like, it's nice to have you let's kind of have some fun for this year and then when you go you go and, and I'm going to be exactly the same as before you left I'm not really bothered by it like I'll just go on living my life um so I mean honestly Cersei might be one of the most like I don't know I don't want to say feminist because it's not you know it's not a term that you can really put back then but she might be the one of the most like just independent and like you know, I don't need you kind of women in mythology in a very fun way. Um, okay, lots more questions. Great. I know you mentioned 300, but what about the movie book series, Troy? Uh, how was that one based on the stories? So the movie, uh, movie Troy, like from 2004, is pretty bad <laughs> in terms of the Iliad. Uh, I mean, it romanticizes a lot. The romanticization of of uh, Achilles and Briseis, I find incredibly troubling. 
I mean, that kind of applies to almost every representation, I think, of that story, because no one really wants to put on screen or into a book the idea that a woman was like literally stolen away after her in every man in her town was murdered and then she was stolen away and enslaved by these people. And then you just have to write that story. So like Silence of the Girls is a great um, version uh, that actually does like look at it from that perspective. Um, but certainly in Troy, like it's kind of gross. The fact that Achilles and Patrick was her cousins will bother me forever. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot of debate about whether or not they were explicitly in a relationship. Homer doesn't say it outright, um, but they certainly were not like cousins, like Brad Pitt and his like little baby cousin in that movie. Um, now I'm just getting very casual in my answers. Uh, but yeah, but I, I'm also not sure about the book series that uh, you're referring to here, unless it means Stephen Fry. Um, what about the maids, like the Odyssey? So now I'm gonna, do you wanna nod? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, yeah, the women in the Odyssey at the end, it's, I mean, that's, that's awful. It's very bad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I don't know exactly. Like it's one of the most horrifying moments in literature, probably. <laughs> um, it's yeah, it's an interesting thing the way that uh, women are blamed in the Odyssey because like, I mean, the suitors also don't deserve to be murdered. Like Odysseus could have kicked them out of his home. That would have been good and valid. He didn't need to kill them all. Um, but certainly, certainly like the, the maids involved were almost certainly enslaved women, which means everything they did was not up to them. And so like literally nothing they did should have uh, caused any kind of like retribution on Odysseus's part. And it's certainly um, disturbing for sure. Um, so, okay, what are my opinions on the modern interpretations of women in Greek mythos, like in Laura Olympus? Um, I mean, I don't, I have trouble, I don't want to like ever, uh, you know, give too much talk one way or the other about modern interpretations because I like don't want to, um, you know, call, like say anything that could be construed as mean to anyone who is writing today because that's not deserved ever. That said, I'm not referring to Laura Olympus in that way because I quite like Laura Olympus. Um, but I also find, for me personally, I think my issue is that um, I'm too deep into the ancient stories. So like I read a lot of retellings. I do love Laura Olympus. I'm totally caught up, except I think it might have restarted again. Um, but the, I find I don't, my brain doesn't want to connect them to the ancient sources. Like I just kind of keep them as this totally separate thing. And I think I need to do that just because I live in this world where like literally every moment of my day is spent researching Greek mythology in one way or another. And so I kind of have to keep the two worlds separate. Like I do find, and this is the case for when I was um, telling the story of the Trojan War on the podcast, I was also reading the Song of Achilles and that like absolutely influenced how I told that story. And so I try to watch that as well. And, like that doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, I just find I have to like really separate uh, my brain on, on like how I see the retellings. I love them. And I'm so glad that there are so many, like there's constantly more retellings of Greek myth coming out typically by women. And I think that's super cool. I think that like, so many women of Greek myth deserve to have their stories told um, and like deserve to have this like new voice, even it is, if it is, you know, a new reinterpretation so many years later, but just kind of like have that voice that they didn't get to have in the ancient sources is generally very cool. Um, uh, are there more depictions of queer women in ancient stories? It's very minimal. Again, like, it's it's basically impossible to put modern understandings of sexuality um, onto the ancient world just because they didn't see it the way we do. Like, you know, it, it, certainly in North America, we the way we understand like sexuality broadly um, is so based in like the number of um, or just like the the history of Christianity that exists in this 
on this continent of ours that um, it, it's difficult to say because like, it's like understanding uh, race as well. Like the ancient Greeks didn't, uh, didn't see a difference between people based on their skin color. It was more about whether or not you spoke Greek. And like, that was kind of what did and did not get you like acceptance or, you know, being treated othered. Um, and it was, yeah, it was more about like where you came from in terms of your Greekness. Like they didn't, care at all you know what skin color people had and and that is kind of similar in the way they understood queerness um like to get a little bit into i mean i think it's still appropriate i don't know um but in the case of like achilles and patroclus they're a really interesting example of um they did not uh, in the ancient times, they didn't debate whether or not they were in any kind of relationship. The question was just like, where, who, which position in their relationship each one of them might have held in terms of their sexual activity um, is oh, the okay. most PG way that I can <laughs> explain that. But like... Okay. <laughs> that that is how um that is how they understood these relationships so it's like our entire understanding of of sexuality and and everything is based around this like whole of thing that didn't exist for them like basically i think it, it would be more like and this is again like based in just my broad general knowledge of history versus mythology but it's more like um, here, Artemis is a good example, and I can use mythology and therefore know more of what I'm talking about. But like, Artemis is called a virgin goddess. Um, but that doesn't mean that she never had sex. It just means she wasn't married. Because the way they understood virginity was just like, were you married or not? But like, she could have been doing, you know, whatever she wanted off with her nymphs that didn't matter it didn't affect her status as a virgin goddess so we don't know we don't have any stories of her like in romantic relationships with women but i don't think that's because that that did wasn't like accepted back then or it wasn't seen or it wasn't talked about amongst certain groups of people i think that it was just like not a concern of the people who were writing the stories down because what mattered is that she remained unmarried so that was what they were more concerned with talking about. If she like had a thing with a woman, they just, it didn't matter to, to their purposes. Um, and so it just doesn't make it down to us. So that's all to say, like, I think we can generally assume that people had all sorts of relationships that we would now see as queer, but they, it just wasn't ever like, or wasn't often written down in a way that we can understand it now, um, particularly with women, because they just didn't care what women did with other women, right? Because the men were the primary, like, the, the reasons they were around. So that's why, like, Artemis is a virgin goddess, because she never married a man. And meanwhile, we know that Apollo had a lot of relationships with men. But we also know that he had relationships with women. And so it's like, it's just kind of, it's almost like if the relationship did not include a man, it didn't matter. <laughs> so it's just, I like to, like, I'm assuming that Artemis had lots of relationships with other women. We just don't know about them. Um, was marriage a big part of Greek and Roman life? Yes, definitely. More so in just in terms of like, uh, like living in the world. Um, like so this is applicable to, to Athens. I'm not great at Rome, so I'll kind of leave them aside. Um, but like, certainly when it comes to like Athenian women, you were a property of your father until you were property of your husband. <laughs> and, and that's like it. If you never married, then you remained property of your father until, I don't know what happens when the father dies. Like they're probably just left out, to like figure out their way. But like Athenian women born in Athens or otherwise, like, I think there are ways that they counted as, as citizens. Uh, but it took a lot and it took probably like a lot of money. Like in order for you to pr be a, a woman in Athens who didn't have a marriage to hold her up, you probably had to just be very rich or very um, like important, which would also obviously come with money. 
Um, so it was more about like class than anything else in order for you to not like live your life unmarried. Um, but again, yeah, the history is like everything I say is based on just things I've taken out of various things I've read, but I'm not, um, don't take everything I say about history as a hundred percent accurate. The mythology is what I got. Uh, do we Thank have you anything so else? much for oh. talking? <laughs> well, do you Thank have you for any... letting me just well, for... talk for now? <laughs> of course. If anyone has any final thoughts, um, you should go ahead and say them or put them in the chat. But thank you so much, Liv, for talking to us today. This was like thank you so much. One of the yeah, this is like one of the most entertaining talks I've been to this whole year. So I'm very glad. I feel very rambly, but I'm glad that it came across. <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot of us are also very rambly, so it made a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think it feels very real, so I'm glad. <laughs> yes. Lots of thank yous in there. Thank oh. you all. Yeah. <laughs> very kind. <laughs> I mean, this is what you get when you get a lot of girls. You just get a lot of thank <laughs> As a I Canadian think... and a woman, I get it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, do I sound like that? <laughs> no, I'm just from Minnesota, so <laughs> I can there turn it on. You've got the other Canada, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is very sweet. Yeah, but thank you again so much for helping me out with this. Well, it's like not necessary, but. Like, it was very interesting for me and just very nice to hear someone talk about it. And you've been so helpful and just very, like, Thank responding. You. A lot of people don't actually respond, so. <laughs> oh, it takes me a while, but I answer. <laughs> so I'm very glad that you also that it worked out well. This is fun. I need to do more things like this, so I'm glad I answered and said yes. <laughs> yeah, well... If you're comfortable, we might invite you back next year. So okay, <laughs> now you have experience, so you can talk about it. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, feel free to send me an email next year. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. Well, I will send you. Um. I don't. I'll send you any updates that I get. You know, to, um, email me with any question, any more questions that you have. But thank you again so much. Have a great day. Thank you, you too, and thank you, everyone. You're very yes. nice. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.